Hello there, Applebites. This is your Applebyte written, writ Ralph talking to you straight from our show here, Applebytes. And I know what you're telling yourself. Where have you guys been? Well, we got to take vacation too. So yes, we're back and we're better than ever. And then we're going to start that off with our friend over here, Jerry, who's going to be telling us a beautiful story about uh, being the hero and not being able to be the hero. <laughs> <laughs> That's a really like rosy way to sum up what we were talking exactly. about there. Yeah. <laughs> oh my god! Like uh, we were just talking in the green room about this, and 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 dude, this story it, it just tugs at the heartstrings because you know, like you're saying, if you're looking at this from a parent's point of view, um, you just can't be there the whole all the time for your kids. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's awful. I have um. So I guess I'll back up and you want me to tell you what, what, what tell everyone yeah, yeah. what's what, what about. Well, you know, you know, I, I feel like sometimes the audience needs to be. You know, what are they talking about? Yeah. Um, so need, what, it, it's time for exposition. Is is give them who you are, what you do. Give them the then give them the spiel. Go for it. It's a little exposition. We need a little exposition. So, <laughs> um, so I I buy. Tr- I've been a reality TV producer for the last like 20 something years. Um, a couple of years ago, I started working with my friends at Blue Juice Comics. That's actually how we met. I think we met at, at yeah. Brooklyn, right? We met at the Brooklyn yeah. Comic Con mm-hmm. earlier this summer. Um, and th- that was my first foray into all this stuff. So, like, I had done a New York Comic Con, but Brooklyn was the first time you walked up to me and you were like, I'm going to come back in a little while. I'm going to point the camera at you and you got to be ready to pitch all your books. Exactly. So get ready. <laughs> and then I was, I think I was in the middle of a transaction and suddenly I looked up and there you were. Um, it was great. Uh, so anyway, so uh, I started do, I started working with my friends at Blue Juice. I started, uh, this is my own imprint that I'm doing to kind of publish my own, create our own stuff. And the first one is what we've been talking about, Cicada right. Samurai. And um, to me, it's a story about, um, if you if anyone knows what cicadas are, those little insects that emerge, you know, some of them every year, but like a million of them emerge every 17 years. And they make an unholy racket and they're awful and they just sound terrible. But they're like defenseless, dopey creatures. Like they're not, they're not, they don't attack anybody. They don't hurt no. anybody. They're not locusts. They're just kind of like, you know, big dopey flies, basically. And I became obsessed with them when they came out. So I started reading about them. And... Um, the same time was going on in my life. I have three kids, and so I started coming up with this story about um, one cicada who is immortal. These cicadas emerge from below the ground. They live for a total of like twenty days, just long enough to crawl into the treetops, mate, and die. And like that's it. That's their whole lifespan above ground. What a life! <laughs> what a life, man. That's it. That's it. Um, if that's all any of us had to worry about, the whole world would be a better place. You know. Um, all right. <laughs> So, Except for what uh, happens to them. <laughs> no, yeah, yeah, totally, totally. So, yeah, uh, uh, and that's the thing. So as these cicadas emerge, thousands of them or millions of them are eaten by birds and, mon- like, you know, giant other insects. Human beings in some cultures eat them. Um, foxes eat it, like, dig them up and eat a ton of them. Um, all these animals will attack them. So what I came up with was a story about a single cicada who's immortal. He's been through this multiple generations. He's the only wise adult among all these adolescent you know kids and mm-hmm. as they're all emerging and going out into the real world like my kids are you know fast becoming teenagers um, his his there you go his instinct is to protect them as many of them as he can and there are millions of them so basically the story is about one magical immortal adult cicada who is a parent in a way to millions of these creatures that are going to emerge from the ground and a lot of them are going to die and they're not going to make it and he's going to try to protect every single one of them that he can anyway, because that's his instinct. That's that's who he is and what he does. And that's sort of like, you know, you we were talking in the green room. I have a 12-year-old boy. You have a 12-year-old girl. It's that same instinct. It's that 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 instinct that a parent has to protect their young. Um, he has that for all these cicadas. And he's going to fit, you know, that he's going to try to protect them. But there are millions of them. And he's going to sometimes not be able to protect all of them. Um, and that's sort of what the story is about. So, you know, this first story arc is going to be the first time we all get to see it. You know, these things emerge from the ground and he's going to try to protect all of them. Um, there's like an awesome villain in the story. There's this thing called the cicada killing hornet. It's a, it looks just like a hornet, but it's larger than a cicada. And they, what they do is they catch and paralyze cicadas, drag them back to a burrow in the ground and then lay eggs around them. And then when the eggs hatch, they eat the paralyzed cicada 
but the little the little ant little monsters that hatch they know not to eat any internal organs that are essential any vital organs so the cicada wow. just lives and is being eaten alive for days for like three or four days um after being paralyzed so it's an awful terrifying monster of a comic book villain in my mind right away i was like that's a comic book villain right that is there. a total comic book villain yeah that's like he's great he's like he's horrible all like they're horrible right away you know they're not right. you, you don't have to make anything up about it um and so that's the story it's about one immortal cicada parent basically who's trying to protect all these little these little bastards who just don't want to listen <laughs> isn't that how it always is that's I'm how it always you, is uh, i'm telling you this because i know something mm -hmm. yeah i'm still gonna do what i'm gonna do <laughs> that's it that's it i showed you the first couple of pages and that's the first thing you see is like is the first thing you see is two little cicadas decide they're going to emerge before everybody else. They're not going to listen, you know, and it doesn't it doesn't go well for them. At all. It doesn't go well for them at all. <laughs> at all. Hey, Shen, how you doing? Uh, good seeing you. Oh, man, dude. It, 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 like I was saying in the green way, it just amazes me because I'm, you know, I talk about this all the time because people are always saying. I don't have anything to write about, especially because they want to be writers and they want to write. Right. And I'm like, look, look at this simple, basic idea and you, that you turn into something else, you know? Yeah. And I feel like sometimes we, we we're looking for, I don't know what people are, like writers are looking for, you know, and, and I'm a writer myself and I, I can't like, like when somebody's telling me they want to write, I'm like, what is it you're looking for? What do you think is supposed to happen in your head? <laughs> you know, yeah. because sometimes the simplest stories become the biggest things. Well, I mean, that's what they all are. You know, all the biggest stories are always, they always start simple. It's always mm -hmm. some, some simple version of, you know, things are not what they seem, you know, that, that kind of trope. Yep. But, but yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's um, getting started is always the hardest part of writing. I think just sitting down yeah, and definitely. deciding the thing that you have in your head is worth typing. It's worth typing out onto a screen or writing out onto a notepad or something. Um, that's always the thing I struggle with the most, you know, is sitting down and actually you know, I have a million, have a million ideas just sitting yeah. there and being like, oh, this would be funny. But exactly. like, would it be funny? You know, and should I write it down? Should I take, is that the thing I want to dedicate the next few weeks of my life to trying to figure out if that actually works? Uh, you know, it can be paralyzing, but um, this has and been funny. just. Because the only way funny. you're going to know is if it works is to start writing. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, you never know. Until you write that thing, you don't know how, what is going to be, what's going to happen, what's going to, you know? Yep. Yep. It's bonkers. Whole process, yeah, and, I, and I don't know. I know a part of it is that people don't want to waste their time, but sometimes this is the craft. Sometimes right. you need to do all that stuff because sometimes that stuff brings you the other story that you want to do. Oh, totally. I mean, that's kind of what this was. Like, I started. I kind of started backwards here. Like, I didn't know. Um, I just became. I get fixated on stuff. So I just. I just. You know, I think it was 2021 when the last um, Brood X, I think they're called, emerged. Right. And, you know, it was all the all the northeast from like Ohio all the way over to the Atlantic Ocean. We're all experiencing this just like cacophony of madness. And I started I just got obsessed with cicadas. It had nothing to do with I didn't have a story. I didn't have like a thought, you know, and then I just started thinking about these bugs that just emerge from the ground and then are dead a couple of days later. They get such a short a short life. Um, it wasn't until probably a few months ago that I really started connecting it to being a parent and you know thinking about my own kids and how short life is in general but that's how that's how what it is you know it, it's it's like um sometimes the simplest things show us the biggest picture yeah and so i got really lucky i see you have on the screen here so i i had this idea i started writing out a little a little summary of it and i started reaching out to artists on instagram that i like and right. like that was and this is like another thing that i think people often on um, when I hear people talk about like upcoming writers and stuff or artists, they're all like people don't know how to connect with who they want to work with. I, I literally just started messaging artists whose stuff I liked. And and one of them, I like I, I almost fell over when he responded. But this uh, Takashi Okazaki, who created Afro Samurai Ooh. and and he replied he he's he lives <laughs> i can see how shocked you are <laughs> oh my god i almost i literally was like i i almost passed out and and you know he's great and 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 like i had this idea that in my head this was kind of a samurai story he's got this noble quest that right. is like a little bit hopeless and he's going to sacrifice there's a lot to sacrifice in the story and um i reached out to him and 
you know, cicadas are apparently, I didn't know this, they're, they're a big part of Japanese culture, Japanese art as well. I had no idea. So he immediately was just into it and just started, I started bouncing ideas off of him via messages on Instagram. Nice. Um, he sent me his email address and I asked him to do some character designs. And this is, this is what he, this is the first thing he came up with. Can you zoom in on that? How does that, how does that work? Let's see if I can. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I think right, on my right. side, I could pinch and zoom, but I'm not sure. Let's see. Uh, 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 it's okay. Uh, oh, here we go. Oh, there, oh, there you go. Look at that. All righty. So yeah, he, he kind of, he created this thing. And basically I said, look, I think, I think that, I think that the cicadas are humanoid underneath. They're still buggy, right. you know, but they're more humanoid underneath. And I think the, that the armor, if you think of a cicada, I always used to pick them up. I don't know if anyone, it might just yeah. be like a Northeastern thing. You know, when they're <laughs> dead at the end of like, right after they all die and there's a yeah. bunch of them laying around and they're just like mm -hmm. crunchy, like a shell. So in my head, that was the samurai armor. That makes and that's kind of what it, and that's kind of what he drew here. And I started, I, I had to zoom in on it before I realized that you can actually see the little humanoid face inside yeah, that mask. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's awesome. And he came up with this little manga kind of design for this character in this giant helmet um, that looks like a cicada. That looks um, too cool, man. <laughs> oh, it's awesome. And then he, I think the next, the next one is probably this. He did the thing where it's in action. So you say he, he He's funny because like he he did these. He's right. very busy. So he's doing Star Wars. He was doing Star Wars Vision, um, a book for them at the time. He started doing Marvel covers. He also does a lot of animation work. Um, so, you know, he'll send me like in a two day period, five things, and then he'll disappear for a few months. There we go. So, yeah, he sent me this one, too. And this is the guy sort of in action with his wings up. And there he is with all of his little weapons. And he's got six you know, six appendages. So he's got four arms. You can see his face better here too. Yeah. Yeah. It's awesome. Yeah. Th I this, was just like, my, uh, this was beautiful. This is just beautiful. Oh, he's great. Yeah. He's great. And yeah. then this is funny. So he, he did this, right? And then because he's so busy, he, he got busy. He just didn't, I didn't hear from him for a few, a, a while. Right. And then he's, and then he sent me, um, a, the Hornet. He sent me the ah. design for the Hornet. The Hornet uh -huh. character. And the Hornet character, his initial pass at it was a little bit more like this. It was a little bit more like a normal humanoid thing inside. And the only thing I said was, I think he should be scarier when the mask comes off. So when he takes the armor off, he should be even more of a monster inside. And this is what he came up with. It's like, it's somewhere in between the alien from Aliens and like the American vampire like claws on the big, on like the big vampires, you know? Wow. It's this big terrifying thing. Yeah, because you know so it's that, eating things. So you, you figure it has to be vicious. That's it. Wow. So he, he sent me something else that was generated in a computer that he had done in Photoshop. And then I I sent back one thought. I was like, I feel like it should be scarier. And he he like a half hour later I had this in my inbox. He just sketched it out real quick. And again, I you know he did Afro Samurai. He's done the, his his um, his visions story is a samurai story. His you know Star Wars vision story. It's in a comic, and they actually they, I think it's one of the ones they made into a, a cartoon short for Netflix or for um, Disney Plus. Right. But he did it all as um, if you know you want to make like a samurai story, and Kurosawa isn't available. You know. <laughs> Takashi's like a great backup plan. You know exactly. what I mean? He's wonderful. <laughs> um, Dude, and this so stuff is I, just beautiful. Oh, yeah. And so this is Mary did this. This is Mary Landro, who I'm working with on, on the book. So Takashi can't, you know, like I said, he's crazy busy. So he, from the beginning, he said, I was Dude, just having the, 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 the beginning done by oh, him. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so we kind of took what he did and we a little bit and we ran with it. She made the helmet a little bit smaller, a little more functional. She made. Mm -hmm. You know, the character looks a little bit older because he's supposed to be kind of an adult. So this this one looks a little older. Um, the other cicada characters will be smaller and, and you know, a little bit younger looking. Um, but this is this is sort of our guy. This is our hero right here. I love the look. It, it's a really good look. Very good. I was, very samurai looking. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, she's great, by the way. Like you saw the other pages she did. Oh yeah, it looks great. <laughs> and Mary, Mary posts a lot online of her other work that she's doing. She's like 
uh, an entrepreneur. She's only 23, I think. And she's got like three companies going. Yeah, here's, here's the, the first page. page of the book you sent me. So this is this is just the yeah, this is the first page. And then um I the I've 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 since rewritten some of the text, but this is the first page. So you've got this thing where this raven who's hungry is swooping in to grab the bunny, and the bunny hears something behind it, and the you can barely see it, but the bottom panel there is the first little cicada hand popping through the ground. Yeah, I see it right here. <laughs> yeah. Here we go. Here it is. We're out. <laughs> oh my god. So, it, it, so it, these it, are like it, they're it, like it teenagers. Reminds me of a kid. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Well, he's a teenager who's been he's essentially a teenager who's been cooped up for his whole life, 17 years below ground. And they're just a few weeks from emerging, but they're, you know, they're teenagers. They're impatient. They're, they're so he just he decides I'm gonna do it, I'm gonna go. And so you've got the one guy above ground who's, you know, he's he's a little bit more confident. And like he's the one who's pushing to let's go, let's check it out. These guys are, you know, they've been lying to us about how dangerous it is. Mm. And his much more his much more nervous friend in tow. But this is all Mary. Mary did the the pencil. It looks really good, yeah. Inks and the colors. And and the lettering, actually. She's a dream, just a dream to work with. <laughs> it looks fantastic. It's beautiful, and you, you already know what's what's coming. <laughs> you know, yeah. it's that it's that feeling when you're telling a kid to not do something and they do it anyway, and you're like, "Oh, son of a!" <laughs> right. If 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 a couple of kids, if a couple of teenagers read this book and just listen a little bit more to their parents, I will consider. Oh it my god, that'd be great. <laughs> just a little, <laughs> just a little. So this is a this is um another story I haven't I haven't um launched yet but there's some of this is on my Instagram and my Facebook and stuff. It's called the Grizzly yeah, Crew. Yeah, mm -hmm. Yeah. This is actually a funny story that I'll I'll probably come on and tell you more detail about it when I'm going to launch this. All right, but cool. My my kid made up this story one day. Oh, I always love that. I got one of those with my daughter too that I'm working on. That's great. They're awesome. This is my little 7-year-old was just standing next to me and suddenly was like, "Dad, here, here's a here's a thing called the Grizzly Crew, and he just started telling me the whole story, and I was ignoring him at first. I was like at the computer, <laughs> as we do, like, yeah, yeah, whatever, whatever. <laughs> and then I went, what did, what did you just say? And I just grabbed the notebook and I was like, just stop talking. Let me write this down. I started taking notes. There so this was my Blue Juice. <laughs> this was my first MegaCon. I was there with Blue Juice Comics. That's um, stick figure guy. You know, you know him? Yeah. <laughs> our buddy guy and he does all this he has like a collection of hundreds and hundreds of stick figures drawn by every creator who's who is willing to draw a stick figure for him oh that's fantastic yeah, I, i'm he's got a great consider collection. doing that too as well going look man i just want to stick figure. <laughs> yeah well that's why he does it it's like you uh -huh. know most of the, most of the artists and everyone i think will do it for it takes them a minute you know they, uh -huh. they don't it's not like you're asking for like frank miller to do like exactly. a custom piece you know <laughs> It must be interesting to see all the different stick figures from everybody. Of course, we, yeah. we both know you're a geek. That's it. <laughs> this is uh, this is actually from the set of one of my TV shows that I worked on. This is oh, um, cool. Um, what's his name from from MythBusters? Adam. Oh, Adam. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So this was in his shop in San Francisco. I thought if the shop looked familiar. <laughs> yeah, we were there. He was. Um, I was on a show called. Um, this was for geeking out. And it was uh, Kevin Smith and Greg Grunberg hosted a show on nice. AMC, and um, they would talk to, they would do geeky stuff and kind of meet these people. And, and this was Greg, flew out to San Francisco. Yeah, there they are, Greg and there Kevin. You go. <laughs> yeah. This is this is a like, hilarious. There's a picture yeah. here. <laughs> there is. This is a ludicrously staged photo. Kevin was like, "Here, come and tell us to do something. Point to the point to the thing and tell us to do it, and then we'll react." And that was <laughs> that was what we got out of it. Um, but that's the set that we, you know that we built for the show. That was a lot oh, of that's such a geek set. <laughs> oh, dude, this 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 show was awesome because we had writers on, and like no one does that. We had um, the two that's guys true. who create who did the Deadpool movies and Zombieland, oh. Rhett Reese and um, I forget his friend's name, um, but they're partners and they do everything together. This is in the Everglades in Florida. You see, I have a knife, I'm like a hunter. Yeah, I see the knife. <laughs> Wide range of stuff I've done in my career. I, I saw is, that from, uh, I, when I was looking at the pictures. I was like, okay, it, yeah, this yeah. has been busy. <laughs> that was a snake hunting. This is Emilio Fields. He's the, um, he was the, he created, he built the set. He designed the set for geeking out for comic book men, too, actually. Uh, he's a good oh, buddy nice. of mine. Yeah. 
I gotta admit, they do well with the, their geek sets because they actually look like geeks. Oh yeah, oh, geeks half. Right. <laughs> this is from a show called Night Fight that I worked on, which is was on History Channel very briefly. And I woke up every day that we were making the show, and I and I was like, "Are we really allowed to do any of this stuff?" These are <laughs> these are grown men who are enormous. I'm a big dude. I'm I'm six mm -hmm. foot. I weigh like two sixty. These are dudes who dwarf me. They're enormous, and they put on. 80 pounds of armor, medieval armor, and they have weapons like this thing, this gigantic sword, which is blunted, but it's still like a sledgehammer. Yeah. And then they and then they just beat each other into submission. And that's nice. that's that's a fight. It's like a game that they do. And like I'll play softball on the weekends. These guys do this. Um, and so we did a competition series for History Channel. And this was we built this whole studio, this big ring, like an octagon out in the middle of Pennsylvania. Dude, it looks fantastic. Weird, it looks like some weird kind of shows. <laughs> yeah. yeah, they had to come down that tunnel in the back. It's fun. There's Greg. We were at the, um, I want to say it was the, like, I see what Star year Trek. Yeah, it, it was. It was the premiere of Star Trek, and it was. It was. They did like, um, they had a live symphony playing ah. the soundtrack while they showed the movie. Nice. Um, it. It was in. Um, oh, where, where where were we? I don't remember where it was, but it was like a premiere. It was basically the premiere party, and all the stars were there. Simon Pegg and all these people it was great. Um, I can see it because I see of, the red carpet. I see the Star Trek. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was so much. That whole show was so much fun. We got to interview. We did interview like J.J. Abrams. We interviewed all these cool oh. people about Greg Nicotero. We you know, all these cool people about stuff. Well, that's always great when you, know, you can actually talk to them because you know you have so many questions uh, uh, as somebody who's been watching all these shows all your life. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was kind of it. Was it was a great show. And then this is Alaska. This is um, Whittier, Alaska. Actually, there's another, there's a comic book that was just on, I think it wrapped up a couple of weeks ago. Um, do you know Justin Gray? Hope, yeah. Hope. Mm -hmm. So he does a new book, a new book called Hope. He's on four issues now. And it kind, it takes place in a town that's kind of like this town, Whittier, Alaska, which is, right. I, I don't know if you know anything about it. It's like this weird town where, it's on the edge of um, Prince Prince William Sound, mm -hmm. and you have to go through something like a six mile long tunnel. It's a one lane tunnel to get to the town, or you have to go by boat. There's no other way in, and there's only That's a few hundred. Re no, <laughs> Our, there's only a few hundred residents, and they all live in one apartment building. Wow! And so he's doing a post apocalyptic story that takes place in a town that's kind of based on that 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 whole concept. But this is just a photo. I have if anybody would survive, boat. those people would. <laughs> yeah. 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 That's it. And so this is just me on a boat with a glacier behind me because I thought that was a cool thing. To, to so no, it is a cool thing. That's beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> this was a, uh, a a Facebook thing we did that was a Halloween haunted house. Neil Patrick Harris hosted it. And my friend wrote the caption. I just thought the caption was fun. <laughs> just because my face is like, it's so serious, you know. yeah. You know, it's not. <laughs> I can Neil, see why so you put know. something ludicrous in there. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I'm just going to explain this to you. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Uh, this was a very short-lived show. This was a pilot for something called Safe Word. We did two seasons of it. It was on an MTV and VH1. That's Raven Simone. And, uh, that's what I thought it was. Okay. Yeah, the face you can't see is um, Damon, Damon Wayans. With, uh, he's got a middle name, though. Indian Wayans. He's like Kevin Hart's best friend. He's a great, okay. he's a great comic, funny actor, great, funny guy. He was like um, an integral part of the show. You know, he became kind of a, a regular character on the show. Um, very funny. It's coming to me. I don't remember it later. <laughs> this is uh, my girlfriend. <laughs> we met on the set of, uh, this was actually also on the set of Geeking, of Geeking Out. Emilio uh, got all this. Like, it has to be something uh, a good story. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, the show the show was on AMC, so we had a, we got a lot of props from from Walking Dead and stuff like that. So this is this was probably a character that was used in the Walking Dead. You know, this might have been like an actual special effect thing that was used in the show. So I, I can see where a lot of your stuff comes from. You you, you lived a pretty good life with um. Not a lot of experiences, which is one of the things that writers need. 
is um, all these experiences because you're writing from places where, you know, and it's 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 a funny thing because you try to explain this to people, and it's like you you're using your life as a basis for the writing that you're doing. You know, no matter what you're writing, you're using things that have happened to you or you've seen or you know, and that's what you're doing. You're taking all this stuff and putting it into a digestible way for your brain to understand it because this is what you lived. And then most of the time yeah. you're taking that and putting it through that lens and trying to show people the story. Um, that's why like uh, a lot of people tell them, tell, um, don't piss off writers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> They'll kill you a million times. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, you just basically take that's kind of what it is. What I do, I, I, I'm, I'm like this story with Cicada Samurai. It's all just my fears about my kids growing up and and going out unprotected, you know, without me, without without some adult that I know and trust to keep an eye on them. And you know, I did. I, I said this to a friend of mine recently. I um, you know, I've I've done a lot of reality TV shows and. Uh, you get a lot of notes from, you know, network executives that drive you a little bit crazy sometimes, you know, because um, you have a vision. There's 300 people between you and where the show is going to air. And they all get they all have an opinion. And they all get to put their hands on it a little bit. Because people don't understand that part because they always think it's like you just do you want something, you do it. No. Right. <laughs> so so I I always. Um, I was telling my friend about this book and I said, I've taken all my all my anxiety about my kids and I turned it into a story about an immortal insect samurai. Um, and do you know how many network notes I've gotten? It's an amazing experience. You just take <laughs> take the thing that you want in your head and, and put it on paper, and then try to make it try to make it fun, try to make it good, try to make it compelling. And you know, I think I think that like here, this is a story that appeals to me because parent, you know, and and my kids are at that age where they think they need you less and less yeah you know i already know i know i, I hate that i hate those words i know it's awful <laughs> it's awful you no. know what i actually you might you might like because you so do you, do you have you have a daughter do you have another yeah. kids too all right so i i um i have three kids the 12 year old is the oldest i have a 10 year old and a seven year old and i forget i think it was i don't know i fall into these internet holes right and i start like watching things on the internet and like I'll watch like a million Bill Burr bits in a row for no reason. Things I've seen, you know what I mean? Right. Mm -hmm. You just kind of get sucked into stuff, right? Yeah. So one of the things recently was, I think it was, I want to say it was Jordan Peterson. I don't know why I was watching, but he said something that was very like interesting to me that I felt it was very soothing actually as a parent. Biologically, there are all these things built into our DNA that make us look for people who are not our family when we get to the age where, you know, we start looking for friends and mates yeah. and things like mm -hmm. that. So when kids get to be like 13, 14, 15 years old, just evolutionarily, they're in their mind, their parents become morons. Yeah. And and they hate you and they don't want to listen to anything you say for about 10 years. There's like a 10 year period, you know, when they're supposed to be out looking for the people that they're going to spend their lives with. And it's just about, you know, not, not inbreeding. It's about finding a mate who's not a relative. So you hate right. your own family for this this ten year period, and then when you turn like twenty eight, suddenly your your parents are not stupid anymore, and they you suddenly start to realize, oh, they were right all along. So they come back, you know. But there's going to be a ten year period starting around now, yeah, where both of our both of our kids, when they turn thirteen, fourteen years old, they're just going to start looking at us like we are morons, and we just need to ride it out for a decade. And then, and then apparently they'll they'll come back and it'll all be okay, you know. Um, so that I found that very soothing. I thought I thought I might share that with you. But it's soothing. It is. At the same time, you're sitting there going, <laughs> yeah, the whole time. Like, what are you gonna, you know, gonna sit around for ten years watching you be an idiot, you know? Or whatever. What are you gonna do? Oh, uh, it's, it's, it's the whole thing that usually what happens is you say something and they go, I know, and I'm like, no, you don't. You're not even listening. Yeah, you to don't. <laughs> you're not even listening to what I'm saying. You're not listening. You don't know. You don't know no. anything. You don't know anything. Like, and it, it's always funny because when they when, when then they go through something and you told them already and they go through it and you're like, you want to say I told you so, but you're like you're, you're trying to be there. For <laughs> like, right. Uh, yeah, I feel like uh, it's a good way that you're doing it to get that stress out because I, I know the stress that you're talking. 
Yeah, it's bonkers. No. Oh. And again, I really like the fact that, you know, it's 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 this concept where, you know, again, people are always asking, you know, how do I become a writer? Or what do I do? What do I? And I feel like they're looking at some kind of, I think they're looking for Lord of the Rings. Right. Right. But it's funny because even Lord of the Rings to, um, to him was this whole epic about what he went through in war. Right. It's just a thing he knew. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you know, and, and it's funny because I I don't know how people look at writers and, and I, what what's their thought process when they're looking at a writer. What, what do you, where do you think this stuff comes from? <laughs> right. Yeah, there aren't a ton of writers who sit there who are like everything I'm doing here is perfect. You know, they're all filled. We're all filled with the same anxiety. You know, and and you just you just got to fight through it and then look at the thing and and rewrite it and don't be afraid to throw it away and start yeah. over. And just try to keep reminding yourself, um, you know, what is the thing I want to say? What's the what's the story about? And again, like yep. at its heart, like I, I'm writing a, a an anthropomorphic insect who knows martial arts and is immortal. And at its heart, he's a parent who is a parent to millions of kids all at one time. And it's overwhelming. And, you know, he's going to sometimes do a great job of protecting them. And sometimes he's not. And that's the story. And that's. You know, at its heart, that's what it is. It's going to be bigger. It's going to be crazier. There's a monster. There's martial arts. There's you need to make up a good story that goes along with it. But at its heart, that's the thing at the middle of it that that appeals to me. Um, and you got to find that thing at the middle of your story and just kind of make sure you're always coming back to it and focusing on that. And that's that's what your story is about, you know. But it's so funny because like um, if you, you we're ta- we're talking about this and you know somebody out there is going, what? Because yeah. you know, in their minds, it, you know, it's a totally different thing. And I, I know you've probably suffered through this. I because I, I, every once in a while, I'll let somebody read something of mine, and yeah. they'll come back at me with um, this whole thesis on what I was trying to do, and I'm like, okay, <laughs> you know, and you're sitting there going, no, <laughs> you know, I know why you yeah. put the blue here because it signifies this and that and that, and I'm like, I like blue. Yeah. <laughs> Blue is just a color I like, dude. That's all. And it's yeah. sometimes it, it's amazing to hear what they come up with, and you're like, "Wow, I, yeah. I, I, I wish I was thinking of that when I wrote that." <laughs> That's a good feeling, though, too. You know, sometimes mm-hmm. sometimes they come back to you and they're like, "I don't get anything. I don't get no. it." Yeah. You know, you start <laughs> to think like, mm, "Maybe I'm not doing a great job of getting what I want across." Right. But if they come back to you and they have their whole own interpretation of the thing that you did, that's, that's kind of cool. Beautiful, you know? yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's great. They read into it whatever they say. Some people are going to read the story that I'm that the Cicada thing and 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 see it. Young people especially, they're going to see it from the younger character's perspective. Yep. You know, definitely. like this hero guy. Like you know, I had a friend. I I knew these guys. Um, I had a friend of mine named Doug many years ago. Um, he saw Karate Kid as a story from Johnny's perspective. You know, this is like before they did the, what's the show called? Cobra Kai? Oh, yeah. 20, 20 something years before that, this guy would always tell me that uh, Karate Kid is a story about Johnny, who is this kid who's like, he's a little bit of a, you know, he's a teenager, but he's mm-hmm. got a girlfriend and he has a whole life and he has a tough life at home. And then this, this kid moves from Jersey and steals his girlfriend and has an old man beat him up in an alleyway and just steals everything that's good about his life away. Like that poor guy, you know, to him, the story was about Johnny, right. about like the villain. So you never know. And he was serious. He wasn't messing around being funny. You know, that's like people, people are going to read into it what they want to read into it. And as long as they're reading something into it, yeah. they're engaging with it and it's cool. And who cares what they think, you know, what they, what oh, they yeah, that's, how, that's how it should be. You know, uh, I like when people like don't have the same idea about something, you know, right. uh, I like when you have conversations about things. Um, I feel like we've gone away from that because like um every, every time I turn around now it's like all this hate on things and I think it's because hate makes um buzz hate is what yeah. people want to see so they they're, they're going to yeah. hate on something even if they don't hate on it they they they're like um they, they still hate on it and I'm like it's, it's easier yeah. to say oh I didn't like that than it is to say well I like that right it's all clickbait mhm you know this oh, is like the thing that like in, the news companies have figured out a long time ago if they if they tell you like stick around find out what's going to kill your kids after the break like you're exactly. going to stick around you know and that's, <laughs> well, that's just the whole tell me now. <laughs> just tell me now and it usually turns out to be nothing it's not a yeah. real thing but like it's that's the whole internet story 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, but the whole internet has kind of figured that out. Like if you want to be your own creator, you're going to get a lot more, you're going to get a lot more clicks and a lot more people checking out your thing in kind of a cheap way. If you're just a hater and you're doing clickbait and you know, and that's all you're doing. Um, as opposed to just like liking things and being positive about stuff and finding a good spin on it, you know. It's funny because it bugs me out because you know there's times where you're talking to somebody, and they haven't really even made up their own mind. They're just right. spitting out points that they heard on the internet or from another person, and you're sitting there going, "Did you even watch this movie?" <laughs> yeah, I'm. I'm always surprised by the hot takes from people who've not even seen things. You know, there's a lot like I'm not going to I don't want to like pick a side here on this particular thing, but a lot of people I follow online lately. Everything James Gunn says about the DC universe, there are people who just instantly hate, hate everything, everything he says and does. <laughs> yeah. like he, hasn't had, he hasn't even had a movie come out yet. You know what I mean? Everything he says and does. Well, what bugs me out too is that they're blaming him for the stuff that was already in the docket. And I'm like, right. has he, does he even have anything to do with that? Yeah, like by all means, when he puts out his Superman, if you hate it, fine, you feel free. But like he, like you know, he didn't. He he was the Flash was kind of in the can. Like it had nothing to do with him. You know what I mean? Like the most he did was try to go. Well, maybe we'll do this so that when I do what I'm doing, it doesn't mess it up. Yeah, <laughs> but just like give everyone a minute and like chill and check it out. Like look at it first and then decide you hate it. You know, you can totally hate it, Michael McKnight. Oh, uh, hi, Mike. How you doing, buddy? <laughs> <laughs> but see, that's what you're saying there is the point, though. People are already hating it before even it happens. So, of course, yeah. they're going to hate it when it happens because they already hate it. They've already decided they hate it. And even if it's yeah. good, they still hate it. <laughs> and that's it. It's just clickbait. It's just people mm -hmm. People like to be mad and they like to hate things. And it's just easier. It's easier I to be funny to if you don't love it. <laughs> I mean, on, honestly, like, again, as like a in reality tv like it's a lot easier to just be like to make it that's why all these shows are like you know women fighting and throwing glasses of wine in each other's faces you know yeah. it's it's all because that's a lot easier to produce and a lot easier it's not it's not super creative it's not super challenging it's not positive and, and people enjoy watching other people tear each other apart so it's well, dramatic it's, it makes it's, us all feel better you know yeah same reason like um reality tv like you, you you've, you've been you've done a bunch of it you know, it's yeah. it's people love this, and and the, the the companies love this because it's cheap stuff they can put out there with so much drama in it. <laughs> yeah, and the drama doesn't have to make any sense or be real. No. You know, I think at this point I'm not letting the cat out of the bag in saying that most reality. I'm gonna I'm gonna say it. <laughs> Go ahead, say it. Most reality TV, not a hundred percent real. I know, right? <laughs> right. Dude, I told that to somebody a while back, right? And they had a knish. Yeah. It, it, it was turning into a, the fight of the century, and I'm and I'm like, dude, relax, come down, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, dude, you know it's true, man, because you know, uh, as an editor, just as yeah. an editor, I already know that I can take the truth and make it look like something else. <laughs> That's it. So you know the expression like a uh, film is a director's medium. Like when you make a film, the director is the vision, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. On a on a scripted television show, it's the lead writer. You know, yeah. your David E. Kelly is he's never the he sometimes is the director now too, but he's often the head writer. He created it. He, his he's steering the whole ship, and other people are directing parts right. of it. Reality TV, it's an editor's medium. Yep. It's all just like. You know, th from the shows that are sort of the, the most realistic shows are things like Storm Chasers, you know, where they'll film for months and they're just yeah. praying for a, a tornado. Have to happen, and then yeah. and then all that footage just goes into an edit bay somewhere and mm -hmm. editors have to make a whole season out of it. Um, that's the closest thing to like, you know, kind of real. And, and even there, you're telling, you're moving things around, you're making it yeah. a little more dramatic, you know. Yeah. <laughs> you're making it yeah, you're trying to have some fun with it. But yeah, but people... People sometimes are like, wait, your Jersey Shore? You mean those guys didn't just come up with all that stuff? I'm like, well, they came up with some of it. Up with some of it. <laughs> it it's amazing. It, it, and it will bugs me out the most, but but I guess it's the same people that I used to watch wrestling with. Like, I, I always understood that wrestling is an amazing sport. You know, it, it's real in certain ways, but it's not real in other ways. 
you know, because you, you can see that the wrestlers would get hurt and they would be out for a while. And, you know, so you know that it, it takes a lot of um, stamina, a lot of um, athletic ability to do what they do. But it's, right. it's not real. <laughs> right. Yeah. I always look at it as it's a sport. Right? Exactly. It's, it's not a competition. Not really. That part of it is what's not real. You know, they'll choreograph it. They'll kind of decide, you know, what the next move is going to be, things like that. But the actual, the, your actual physical ability to do those things that those guys do in the ring is absolutely athletic. And, you know, they're all freaks. The same as any other professional athlete. Right. They're all mutants who are just able to do things that you and I can't. And and that's a sport, but it's not necessarily a real competition. Yeah, but it, it, it's entertaining. It's something to watch. It, you know, um, as the years progress, you know, it changes for people because, you know, my, my whole thing is the 90s and the trash talking, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, can't you yeah. smell what the rock is cooking, you know. You yeah, know, yeah. I looked back recently. I forget what it was I was watching, but I looked back recently at, at an old, it must have been just like an old WrestleMania. And, or it might have just been the, remember the Saturday morning show when, when it was all like the big wrestlers would fight these no name jobbers, yeah, right? I remember those, yeah. Yeah. And so they would always cut to these things where like Bobby the Brain Heenan would be holding a microphone in front of some wrestler and he'd be talking trash yeah. to somebody. And it was always live. You know, they would cut to it live like it was the news. Exactly. We're and it was always, yeah. <laughs> we're over here with this guy, and he's like, I'm coming for you. And, and then and then there would be this long, awkward period where they didn't cut away fast enough, and he just had to be like, like grunting and stuff. Yeah, ridiculous. <laughs> totally, totally hilarious. But yeah. Oh my God. Anyway. But entertainment is just a funny thing, you know, and I, I feel like um, what starts to happen is, is the creative stuff starts to like be thrown out the window, and we get all this stuff that hollywood this will make us money <laughs> you know and then you know that that's when it stuff starts to suffer is when they figure out oh we got a formula where we can make money and not have to put too much money into making the money right you know when well i mean the business, formula mm -hmm. what's kind of sad is the formula they figured out is one that requires them to pour a ton of money into it yeah. and now that it's sort of slowing down a little bit you know there's a little bit of again i'll say i'll say this out loud there's a little bit of comic book movie you know that people are getting a little tired of those stories a little bit you know um they're not all making a billion dollars anymore you know um and they may never again they may never do it again because you know covid and all these other reasons people haven't really swarmed back in the movie theaters that much that mm -hmm. often um but that whole process of making a making a putting 500 million dollars into producing a movie and then another 200 million dollars into promoting it yeah. because you know it's going to make a billion dollars in yep. the end of the day or more that that whole kind of thing is is you know that system is kind of already dying and so I you know they got to figure something out it was dying before the pandemic um yeah. i feel like before the pandemic people were like all right we need entertainment so it kind of still stayed for a little bit and i agree with you now i feel like we're at that point now where um and at the same time, they're throwing money into it. They're throwing money more into things that don't really matter to the movie and things that don't help the movie, you know. Right. And I feel like because of that, you're beginning to see, you know, you know, like uh, the, um, the graphics are suffering, like, you know, uh, right, right. All, all the stuff that they should be putting money into, they're not putting money into. Right. They're trying to cut corners to try mm -hmm. and try and make their money back, which is what happens in TV. That's like mm -hmm. kind of what happens in unscripted TV a lot, oh, my, in my experience. But everywhere, you know, the, the graphics are always the first thing that they start to mess yep. with. I think it was I, I think it was um, I want to say it was Matt Damon and I want to say it was on that. What's that show that they do where they have to eat all the hot wings while they're talking? Oh, yeah. Somebody the host of that show asked him like kind of an off the cuff question and he gave a super intelligent that guy is so smart. He gave just a super weird, intelligent, in-depth, inside baseball answer to this question. And the question was, you know, you got famous doing the talented Mr. Ripley in movies like that. How come they don't make movies like that anymore? And he gave this, like, crazy smart answer. And it's about what we're talking about. It's mm -hmm. They figured out there's no risk in making, you know, another Avengers movie. There's no risk in it. You know you're going to pour 400 million, and you know that you can promote it to the point where you're going to make your money back. There's no right. risk. There's no risk of a flop, you know. No. And so studios would rather do that than invest money in 
30, 40, 50 million dollar movies like The Talented Mr. Ripley, which might open at the box office and only make 20 million. Yep. You know, they might not make their money back. So they don't, the big studios don't do those movies anymore. And and if you're lucky, Netflix does a couple of them, like the Glass Onion movie, you know, that, that, um, that, that, um, Knives Out sequel. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like if you're lucky, they'll do stuff like that sometimes. But even they are doing, you know, Free Guy and all these other big things. So, these are all, by the way, the hellos we're getting in here. These are all my sister's friends. <laughs> so Michael, hey, Michael, and, yeah, <laughs> Caitlin, Caitlin. I, I used to coach Caitlin in basketball when she was like 11 years old with my little uh-huh. sister. They've known each other since they were little kids. That's uh, pretty cool. Uh, it, it's always good to have, um, you know, a lot of people. Here's a good thing to talk about because especially you got a Kickstarter coming out, and you know, it, it's important to have this base support. You know, yeah, and, yeah. I, and I know a lot of uh, I saw, we end up having we suffer through it because sometimes the people closest to us are the first people that don't support us, <laughs> right, and right. Um, it, it gets to that point where you're sitting there going, "Dude, if if you guys just help me out a little bit, you know, you know, it, it'll get the buzz flowing, it'll get the movement going, it'll get the you know, I find that anytime you have a great base, that's right. when you know you do well because you already have a good base." Right. Yeah. yeah, I mean, you really need to do that, especially, and this is what I've learned for the last two years about comics and how the whole industry works. And and I kind of, you know, I didn't grow up reading comics. I didn't I didn't have a favorite local shop when I was mm-hmm. a kid. The first the first comic series I read was The Walking Dead, and that was on the set of Comic Book Men. I worked on Comic Book Men first season. Um, the Blue Juice guys that company started on the set of Comic Book Men right. because we all had these ideas for two and three hundred million dollar movies and no one's going to give us that money. So no. <laughs> they started, they started making comic books instead. Um, and I, you know, I, I took me eight, eight or eight or 10 years to come around and join them. But, but um, when, when I started learning about how the process of getting a comic into, into stores and how at the time it was that one, there was one distributor in the whole country that kind of did all the comics for everything. And they explained that all to me. And I started looking into it and I was like, how has this not all been replaced by, an app at this point it's crazy it's like a the system is bonkers Mm -hmm. and 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 as i think we all know i don't think this is controversial it's kind of broken you know and there are multiple distributors now dc marvel or with different companies images with somebody like they're not all using the one distributor anymore and those of us who are trying to i made things even crazier (laughs) oh yeah absolutely and 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 you know comic shops get this is the same thing with everything comic shops get squeezed yeah and so they can't take risks, Mm-mm. you know. So what's going to sell? They know Batman's going to sell. They know Sp- They know Spider Man's going to sell. They know capes and tights are going to sell. So that's what they all focus on. And it's very hard to find successful, independent comic shops beyond a few, a handful of really famous ones um, that focus on indie books. And you just right. can't find stores that are willing to take that risk. So you know, we're all turning to Kickstarter. We're all turning to Patreon. We're all turning to Indiegogo. You know um all these other places to to kind of find your base and so if you if you have a base of just a few hundred people a few hundred people who like the stories you tell it helps so much it helps so much and just a few we just did a kickstarter with blue juice our first one um it was for billy the kit you know and i think we had 205 or 204 people who who pledged and and um supported the supported the book and that's on the heels of a justin gray created this created the series he had a Kickstarter for Billy the Kid a few years ago before before Blue Juice picked it up. Um, you know, and Justin gets a few hundred subscribers to all of his projects. If you have just a few hundred people in yeah. the whole country, in the whole mm-hmm. world, really, a few hundred people who are like, you know what, I like your stories, I'm going to buy the next one. Uh, it is it infinite. Oh my God, it's infinitely better than than you know trying to just throw your story into. A, distrib- a distribution system that doesn't super work and trying to get the attention of every comic shop owner in the country. You know, you kind of have to create your own buzz and that's kind of what yeah. Kickstarter does. It helps you sell, pre-sell some books, basically. That's kind of what it is now, pre-sale. Mm-hmm. It helps you pre-sell some books. It helps you build some buzz. It helps you find a little following of diehard fans. Right. And, you know, without without those people willing to support you and take a take a risk on the, on the dopey thing that you created, you know, um, none of these things we get out you know these these stories that we all i've the last few in yeah the last, there's mine that hasn't hasn't um 
gone live yet. Uh, we're probably going to go live in 10 days. That's my, my, my goal is September 14th. So here's the good um, thing. I put it up here, and especially because of what you're talking about, um, yeah. a lot of people, they go, oh, I, I don't know what to do to help. And I, I, I feel like um, if you guys can see see this right now, right now, if you go on to this, if you follow the, the I'll put the link into the, the messages. If you follow the messages, the, the link in the messages, this thing will go to something where you sign up, you know, to get notified. Now, right. um, the more people sign up to get notified, the better place it puts the project in once Kickstarter starts it up, because now you have a following following it. So they do right. some, they, they, it actually helps the algorithm out. So if you guys like, oh, I don't know what to do. I don't have any money. Dude, if you can sign up to get notified, that helps a lot. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and you're right. Totally. Right now you're in a good place um, with 82 followers. Uh, but uh, it's always good to start off with at least 100 followers. That's what I'm going for. That's my goal. Yeah. I think we, I think we, when we launched, when we hit launch on the latest Billy the Kit one, I think we had 120. Yeah. That's so a good place my, to start, my yeah. goal is another, yeah, in the next 10 days, I'm going to be pushing this out a lot and I, I hope to get to over 100. Um, but yeah, you're right. It's, it's all, all these things are just the algorithm now. So everything, you know, Kickstarter has its own algorithm. They're trying to put um, comics that they think will appeal to their, on, yep. you know, users in front of the right people it's kind of the i would i think it's kind of like the as we talk about algorithms it's like the most altruistic one you know mm -hmm. instagram and instagram and facebook and places like that they're trying to keep your eyes on instagram yeah. or facebook you know so they're going to put whatever whatever they think you like and will stick around for um but if you can show youtube for example we're on youtube right now if you can show youtube that you are a consistent content creator they reward you by putting you out there yeah Kickstarter rewards you by showing that you have a following of people, you know, because that's how they make their money. If I, yeah. if I raise a lot of money, they get a small percentage of my money of that money that, that, that I raise on my book. So every little bit helps every follow. Helps. That's exactly it. That's exactly it. And I'll come back and do another one, you know, right. and then and I have, now I have a base of followers who will all get an alert. Hey, you like this last book, check out the new one, you know, and but that's a great way to help. It helps Absolutely. out a lot because, you know, um, so getting people to notice something, sometimes getting the word out there by itself is a difficult thing. So now if, you, if yeah. you, all, all these people are signed up and then their emails are attached to it, they get this notification going, oh, you liked this book before. It's about to do another Kickstarter. Right. Yeah, it's it's infinitely helpful. So, yeah, anyone, if you're if you're listening, if you're watching, please check it out. If you, you know, if you're a parent, I think you're going to really like the story. I agree. If you just like violence and gore, like you're also probably gonna like the story. <laughs> Lots of that in there too. You know? Dude, it does have a nice aliens feel to it as well, especially from you know all that what you just finished describing about what they do to the cicadas. Um yeah, horrible. It has a good zombie feel to it. <laughs> Dude, I didn't even tell you about the praying mantis. Uh oh. <laughs> I'm not gonna, but they're horrible. Dude, they're already horrible as it is by themselves. Ah, <laughs> uh, they're amazing. They're amazing. Insects are scary, man. They're all just monsters, little little monsters. That's all they all are. Well, it kind of makes sense, especially with the praying mantis, because you know you have kung fu styles that are based on, you know. <laughs> Dude, you should look this up somewhere on YouTube. It's a thing. If you look up kung fu, I think it's kung fu mantis, the orchid mantis when it's little. Um, it, there's a video of it. I think it's I think it's Richard. At which one is it? Richard or David Attenborough who does the. Richard Attenborough. Uh, yeah. Richard Attenborough. Is it? Or see, I get confused now because the other one was in Jurassic Park. One is one is the British guy who does all the nature videos, and the other one brought back the dinosaurs. You know. Um, <laughs> so anyway, whichever one it is, I think it's David Attenborough. David Attenborough is the narrator of this thing, and it's a short video. It's a kung fu mantis. It's a little. It's a juvenile orchid mantis, and the orchid mantis is this beautiful purple and white thing. When it's little, it's black with these bright red claws, and it's being chased by like a jumping spider, and finally, it's going to lose. It's going to get chased down, and it turns around on the spider and just strikes this like big kung fu pose to kind of freak it out, and the spider just turns around and walks away. That's pretty They're cool. awesome. Though. <laughs> it's a great. It's like they already know kung fu. You know, they already know. You, you got it right. It's David Attenborough. Richard is, the actor. Richard is the actor. <laughs> Richard is the actor. 
it's a good thing. You know, these little things are, are beautiful because you just look things up really easily, especially as a writer. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I have to turn my internet off when I'm when I'm actually sitting there. I get too distracted. I just get I just get sucked into stuff. Oh, when I'm writing, yeah. Unless I'm researching something, this, this right. cannot be near me. <laughs> no. And then that's what usually happens. Is like, is like um, oh wait, what, is, what what was that? And then you go. Next thing you know, it's three hours later. And you're like, <laughs> exactly. Because <exactly. laughs> then you know, exactly. you know how it is. this leads to that. That leads to this. That leads. Next yeah. thing you know, you're 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 on the second story you're working on. You're like, wait a minute. Three hours have gone by. Yeah. Uh -huh. Oh man. So people. Uh, you guys got to check out Thorny Comics. You have to check out their beautiful Kickstarter. I'll put it back up here on, uh, on the screen. I put the link in the comment section there so you guys can go sign up to be notified. And again, that really helps out a project. He's at 82 already, so getting to 100 shouldn't be that hard. Yeah, I've got 10 days left. So if I get if I get two a day, I'm good. So what we'll do is when you when you finally release, we'll have you on as a guest host, and you you can show off your stuff again. Uh, I'm excited for it, man. I'll yeah. I'll share it too. I was I was hoping to have the cover today, and it didn't it didn't come through in time. But the cover for the book, uh, you know, the actual fully rendered, colored hero character. Nice. Um, I would have loved to share that with you. Oh, don't worry I about will. it. Um, you come back as a guest host, and you can share all you want. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Yeah, I found that a, a nice way to like, um, especially when, when people who have Kickstarter projects, is, is to bring them on as a guest host. That way, you know, because you know, we'll talk, we'll have you do your thing for about five ten minutes, and then we'll move on to whoever the guest is. But it also gets your your, your uh, more eyes on what you're doing, so it's, it's right. a good yeah. balance. And yeah, then we I have a guest it. host, which always helps. Sounds <laughs> awesome. That sounds great. All right. Uh, so, so let me so let me so let me ask you, how did I do here? Okay? Oh, you did fantastic. We, we've right, gone all through so many topics. Uh, we geeked out good. <laughs> okay, this is my first. This is my first interview for any for apart from like applying for a job. This is my first interview, so I just want to make sure I did okay. I I, I, I didn't have any worries because I, I know you're a geek at heart, and okay, you know, especially okay. from watching your life story or part of your life story here, I can tell that you you know you you've been geeking out from the from the get go. Uh, this so. Is true. I did want to ask you. Um, you ended up um, starting off with Blue Juice, and we've we've known them for a long time now, um, yep. and we love them. That's why we, we usually try to uh, show up and cover whatever they're doing or whatever's new. Uh, but what what do they have coming up? Because you might, when you're here, you might as well say, you know. Oh, totally. Yeah. So we actually we have another Kickstarter campaign that we were we were we were ready to launch. Um, Kickstarter has a lot of rules which are in place and they're very good rules and, and one of them is because we are new to it we have to fulfill the first campaign 100% yeah. before they mm -hmm. let us launch a second one so um, once done you've before. done that a few times yeah once you've done it a few times they let you kind of skirt that rule a little bit but we're not there yet so Billy the Kit um, the we, we've we ordered the, the, the books they're right. on the way we'll be shipping them in about a week or two um, and then that'll be fully fulfilled. Once we can click the button and say we did it, it's done. Um, the next one's Anne Bonnie. And Anne Bonnie was actually, Anne Bonnie had been um, Blue Juice's most popular book. Um, yeah, it for, was. For a lot of years, yeah. It's a lot of like really cool covers and imagery. People always walk up to the table when we're at any con. Yeah, to talk about I it. always get the, 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 what's going on with Anne Bonnie? Because, you know, because we, you know, we talk to you guys all the time. And then for a yeah. while, I was like, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, look, the pandemic kind of slowed everything yeah, down. Yeah, exactly. And, mm -hmm. and just kind of the way the thing works is, you know, they, we've never really had had it going ongoing every month. And it wasn't, it, it was always showing up when it showed up. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And so that was it. We kind of what what the way Blue Juice operates on a lot of these things is we do an arc. And then once mm -hmm. that arc is ready, we launch. Right. Um, and then once that arc is over, we start the next one. So there's a gap, you know, and it depends on how long it takes. Mm -hmm. and all of us have day jobs. So for a lot of us, this is like you gotta pay you for know, the dream, people. You gotta pay for the dream. <laughs> that's it. That's exactly it. And and so the next one we're doing is Anne Bonnie. It's a new volume of Anne Bonnie. We've done three volumes so far. Right. Um, Orion Martindale and Nick Justice are the creative team on it. They have been for the last since, since the last volume. Right. Um, they're awesome. Nick has actually did the art for my Grizzly Crew book too. Cool. Um, and we were just at a Comic Con together last week. We were at Fairfax Comic Con last week. Oh, yeah, I saw that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
he's awesome. So that's the next book we have coming out. And then we're hoping that Accelerators will be next. And Accelerators is was was Blue Juice's first book, um, the I first book that they wanted. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep, that was the first one they ever wanted to do, conceived on the set of comic book men. Um, our assistant camera operator, who's now a screenwriter, created came up with this concept. Um, we, we have four volumes, the fifth and final volume. It's an, it's always been conceived as a story that would end. Right. So the end is coming. Um, and he's working on the outline and the first couple of scripts for the final volume now. But the, the, ne- the most imminent thing is Anne Bonnie will be live on Kickstarter. Um, we'll have the pre-launch page up hopefully by the end of this month. Let That'll us know. Next big thing. Have you back on. Yeah. You can talk. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah, I love it, man. Billy, Billy the Kit, um, we did one issue. I don't know if we're going to do another Kickstarter for Billy the Kit, uh, the, but that next volume will be in stores ideally in, in uh, mid-2024. Right. Well, with Billy, I'm not too worried about because it, Billy comes out no matter what happens. <laughs> yeah, Billy does. Billy's and, you know, you know, such a great you, character. You got some good people um, who want to make sure that book happens, so they're, they're going to make sure it happens. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we get a lot of questions. Those are the two big sellers these days, mm-hmm. and Bonnie and and Billy the Kid. Yeah. So, um, and you know, and again, not to Kickstarter's horn, horn too much, but like, just the the fact that we were able to get two hundred people to come forward and say, you know, yes, please do more of these, um, is awesome. And when we do, and Bonnie, it'll be it's fifteen issues. This will be the fifteenth issue. We've done a fifteen issues in the main story, and then there's a couple of one shots in there as well. Um, so there's a lot of there's a lot of content there already, and some people, you know, a lot of people aren't already aware of it. Um, but Anne Bonnie is still every convention we go to; it's our bestseller. Yeah, it is. It's beautiful. Um, I love the story, and of course, you know, we're, we're good, strong female character. So that's it. That's it. So um, conventions, you know, you mentioned them. Uh, which ones are the next ones you're hitting? Oh, um, I'm not sure. Actually, we. <laughs> We have we do this. It, it's like hot and cold. Like I'll hit three in a month, and then and then not not one. Yeah, I noticed. So you know you're busy. Yeah, and then you're not busy. <laughs> well, that's what it is. It's all around. It's all around the day job, right? So yeah, it's true. Um, so so I had I had some time this summer, and we did a few extra conventions. What's nice is I live in Brooklyn. I'm in New York, so the Brooklyn Comic Con was a local one. That was an easy one to hit. Um, two years ago, we did the Jersey State Comic Fest. Um, we'll probably try to do that one again next year. Um, we're not Comic doing Fest, always a blast. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, it was so much fun. I was actually the last year was my first one, and I didn't know it was in a hockey rink. It's yeah. in like an ice, like Dude. an ice rink. Yeah, I find that if it's the hottest summer in the world, you still freeze your ass off. Freezing. It was it was 105 degrees outside, and it yep. was 40 degrees inside. Uh-huh. I had to wear sweatpants, like a sweatsuit yep. inside. We um, love that place. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That was awesome. Um, yeah. Uh, so yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure. I'm not sure the next one I'm hitting. We're gonna start. I'm gonna start looking at ones that are uh, later in the in the uh, in the winter. And, and you guys and weren't able to get into um, New York Comic Con, right? We didn't apply Comic-Con. this year. Okay. Yeah. So they used to do. They did. They did New York like in 2014, 2015. They did it a few years in a row. Mm-hmm. Um, we we did the first one back after the pandemic. Yeah, I remember that one. Our, yeah, it kind of kicked our. Yeah, it kind of kicked. That's why I met our pals from Billy. <laughs> oh yeah, that's right. That's right. Um. You know, so that's so. So we did that one. Um, we haven't hit one of the bigger ones like that. We hit MegaCon because most of the Blue Juice guys live close by. Makes so sense. MegaCon is yeah. So MegaCon is kind of a no-brainer. Where we did that was last year. I don't think we're doing MegaCon next year. We did two years in a row. Um, but yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. As soon as I know, I'll let you know though. Ah, don't worry about it. I'll either see you there or you'll tell me. <laughs> that's it. That's it. Oh, that's so awesome. already you, you got a. Followed on Kickstarter. Let me know how I can help. Thanks, Mike. I appreciate it, buddy. And that's Tommy Campbell. That's my cousin. <laughs> hey, Tom. It's always great to have people, man. It's always great to have people. <laughs> I see Tommy Campbell, the one that said, "Hey, hey, um, hey, Jerry." That's my guy. That's my that's my dad's first cousin. Dude, that that's support because, um, so, like I said, sometimes the, the first people that should support you are the ones that don't. <laughs> oh, absolutely. And the, and the one thing about Kickstarter, I know that if 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 you start strong, yeah. you're more likely to become one of those projects we love, and then they yep. put you out there more. Exactly. So you know, if, if those of you who are following other Kickstarters, this Kickstarter for sure. But um, you know, if you can on the first day, try to support the projects right away, 
because that immediately tells Kickstarter people are interested in this project and they they put it out there more. So that's another way you can help. If you if you know you're going to support a project, try to do it in the first 24 hours. Oh yeah, definitely, because that's what they look at. They look at that first initial um, jump. Even though um you know if you do well through the whole thing, it works out for you. But they they want you to fund in those first 20 24 to 48 hours. Right. Uh, Son of Saint, I fun. did see you over there. Hey. You know, <laughs> um, we got lost in conversation, so you know, we, we I just didn't get a chance to put you up. <laughs> oh man, so there you have it. Go support Thorny Comics. You will see a lot more from Jerry here. And if you guys get a chance to go see him at one of the conventions, go do so. Uh, Jerry you can geek out with the best of them. Uh, we had a great conversation at um Brooklyn Comic Con, you know, uh, it was a lot of fun. <laughs> that was a lot of fun. And Ming, Ming, you know, the, I had a good time there too because Ming was there too, and it was kind of a smaller convention, so I got to hang out with Ming. Um, Ming, it, Ming, it was like a talk show, yeah. I remember he, yeah. was, he was there when I, um, one of the times I came to see you, I was like, oh wait, he's talking to Ming now. I'll come back. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Ming's Ming's a really good guy. He's a buddy, and he's always supported Blue Juice, and he's been very supportive of what I'm doing. Um, you know, he's just he's just a great guy. He's at a comic. He's at a convention this weekend too. He's at a convention every weekend. Ming is at a Dude, convention man. every weekend. I don't know why he's not in a convention. There was one time we, I was, I saw him like three conventions in a row, and I'm like, yeah. "Am I following you? Or are you following?" Me? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. He does. Oh, the, he does a lot of them. He loves it though, man. He loves traveling. It's great. Dude, he's one of the comic men. You know, this is what we were. Dude, if I could spend yeah, the rest yeah. of my life just doing conventions. <laughs> oh, actually, I should I should mention that it's not in the it's not in what I sent you yet. But Walt Flanagan, also from mm -hmm. Comic Book Men, right? Who's from the Tell Him Steve Dave podcast, right? And he did um, War of the Undead, Cryptozoic Man. He's done a lot of comic book work. He did um, some of Kevin Smith's Batman artwork back in the cool. day, Cacophony, Widening Gyre. Mm -hmm. um, Walt Flanagan is doing a cover for me. Ah, there you go. So yeah, he, he did this cover. <laughs> yeah, it's great. He sent me he sent me this sketch. He's like, he's great because he, he likes he likes old school monster stories. So he's in, and I, I I've been trying anyone anyone who's done any of these covers for me. We I try to give them as little direction as possible. I just want to see what they come up with. So I gave him. I just kind of was like, it's a cicada. It's actually kind of humanoid costume, you know, fighting monsters. And he came up with this dude who's just like this giant. Mo like the cicada himself looks kind of scary like this big scary monster of a guy um and i love it i just love the other the like the violent uh, interpretation of it the wall came up with so i'm excited to share that with everybody too i can't wait to see what you come up with i already i love the idea of the story so i can't wait to like um get my hands on it <laughs> you know guys uh it's been a pleasure talking to you jerry as always um folks Thank go you. make sure you support this like we said, if you can go right now and sign up to be notified, you know, that's always a great thing, you know, because that really does help a project. And it, it, sometimes it even helps you start off as a project we'd love. Yeah. Like, yeah, like you were saying. Absolutely. Yeah. Just getting that a strong start is like the biggest mm -hmm. thing from what I can tell. Oh, definitely. Uh, Mr. Nett, we got anything uh, you need to tell us? No. <laughs> I knew you were going to be like that. Uh, so, folks, we are back. Uh, most likely, Apple Bytes won't be here for the next two weeks, only because next week is September 11th. And the week after that is my birthday. And I'm not doing a show on my birthday. It's <laughs> a holiday. It should be a holiday. Is what he's really saying. He won't give me control. You can do whatever you want, it, 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 uh, folks, right now. Make sure you you um, DM Nat if uh, so he can do a show on on his own. He he's all more than welcome. To. <laughs> Nat, I'll come on with you. There you go. <laughs> Let's do it, man. Let's do it. We'll come up with a whole little thing, a little list of what to talk about, right? I'll be I'll be three or four days into my campaign. I just refreshed the page, by the way, and I got eighty five followers now. So you guys have already helped me add three people. <laughs> That's it, dude. If but... you want to do that on September eighteenth, you and Nat can come on the show and geek out. Nat, I'm in. You let me know, buddy. So ju just a fair warning to you. You've oh. seen the boondocks before, right? Yeah. yeah. Our last show where I was in charge, we had Uncle Ruckus try and figure out which anime girl he would date with. <laughs> and we turned it into like The Bachelor oh, and which one he would that. end up going with. <laughs> 
Got it. Yeah, I'm, I'm just checking my calendar here. <laughs> I'm just checking my calendar here. I think I'm busy on the 18th. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I got, I got Folks, a lot going on that Tune night. in to find out what happens. Will Jerry be here? <laughs> Will Nat take over the show? Will Uncle Ruckus make another appearance? <laughs> I love it. Uh, of course, Wednesday we should be on. Um, I think we have somebody on on Wednesday. Either way, we'll be on Wednesday. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the written writ on Wednesday, 10.30 p.m. Eastern time. We'll be geeking out with uh, a plethora of story ideas and maybe uh, uh, some good stuff that's coming um, soon for you guys. Of course, as you know, if you want to come on to the show and, and talk about your book, talk about what you're doing, talk about what's going on, you're more than welcome to just hit me up. And if you want to see something on the show, if you want to speak, the show to be about something, you can always hit us up in the comments section or just... Go, hey, Ralph, when you see me, or send me a, an email, a text. You know, I, I'm just like um, Kim Possible. You know, beat me if you want to meet me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm showing my age. I don't care. <laughs> it's fine. All Be right, proud. Folks. Huh? Be proud of it. Exactly. I'm always am. <laughs> Especially when you're a geek. Because you're, you're going to bring in some geek reference. <laughs> All right, folks, there you have it. Uh, join us on Wednesday at 10.30 p.m. Eastern Time for the Written Writ. Other than that, have a great night. And, of course, on this show, it ends totally different than it does on the Written Writ because I actually have it in. Dios amigos.